I have the very distinct privilege and pleasure of introducing tonight's conversation between myself, my colleague, Thomas Lax, Associate Curator in the Department of Media and Performance Art here at the museum, and the legendary artist and activist, Faith Ringgold, who has agreed to join us here tonight. The conversation has been organized to coincide with the display of Faith's magnificent painting, American People Series Number 20, Die, from 1967, that, as you can see in this image, is currently on display in the fourth floor in the museum's collection exhibition devoted to art of the 1960s. So, let's see. To focus for a minute on Die, this work is the culminating masterpiece in Faith Ringgold's American People series, which she began in 1963. And it is a work with a direct connection to the race riots that convulsed American cities in the summer of 1967 and remains to this day a searing indictment of race relations in the United States that unfortunately um, remains all too topical despite the almost 50 years that have passed since its making. Faith has, has spoken to us in very moving terms about the impact that seeing Pablo Picasso's anti-fascist painting, Guernica, here at MoMA in the 50s and 60s had on her. And she's also spoken about how important the artist Jacob Lawrence was to her as a model for what a black history painting could be. We are just so thrilled that she's agreed to come here tonight to speak with us about those sources of inspiration for American People series number 20, Die, along with others, and other topics pertaining to its making, its history, and its contemporary relevance. I think I said at the beginning, or maybe I forgot, that Die is a recent acquisition for this museum. It entered our collection just in April of this year. At the same time, we acquired this absolutely spectacular group of collages and works on paper from the early 70s that represent another vital dimension of faith's activist practice. Such acquisitions, along with Dye itself, continue an urgent task for us here at the museum, which is that of constructing a richer and more integrated art history and of confronting the racist and the sexist attitudes of the past that have left all of us with so much work to do. So I think for us, tonight's conversation is a very important part of that work, and we're really looking forward to it. Just a few words before we get, before I join uh, Faith and Thomas about how the evening will unfold. Thomas and I have selected a series of images to ask Faith questions about, um, probably way too many images. Uh, we could stay here for hours and hours, but at present, the uh, program's scheduled to conclude its open the conversation up to questions from all of you and for those people who are joining us by live stream. And there'll be a reception afterwards in the lobby where you'll have an opportunity to speak with Faith in person. One last quick special thanks from Thomas and myself to Jess Van Nostren in the Department of Education, to Achille Tomasino in the Department of Painting and Sculpture, and to Grace Matthews. Faith Ringgold's assistant for all of their help in making this evening possible. So uh, with no further ado, we'll get started. Thank you. Right. So let's see, Faith. Mm -hmm. So we thought we would start off with a picture of you. I have a question for you, Faith. I have to just start by saying that being here next to you on the stage of the Museum of Modern Art is a dream come true. So thank you. Aww, thank and you. it's a, a pleasure to be with 
Yeah. Oh, please, I don't have to be a dream. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to I wanna zoom out um, to go back to your early start. I think for myself, um, I got to know your work um, starting as a child with my mother reading children's books, your fantastic children's books to me. And I imagine for many people here, um, being a child and starting off with seeing your work meant that they understood the possibilities of what art could be. Can you talk a little bit about your childhood growing up in New York and Harlem and what it meant to go to school at City College um, and a little bit about that background um, with your mother um, working in fashion and how that informed some of your own sense of what it meant to be a creative person? Well, I had the very fortunate uh, position to be a child who was always having art in my life. Uh, of course, art was taught in the school. And uh, unfortunately, today, a lot of schools don't have art. But, and I also had asthma as a child, so I was home a lot with asthma, and my doctors didn't want me to be in school. They wanted me to, because they don't want me to catch the germs that the children had. And, and children would die from, from these different uh, things that they had not, uh, they had no cure for. Mm -hmm. huh? So it was dangerous. I was on a special diet, and I had lots of art at home. My mother would go and get my lessons and all and bring them home. And I was homeschooled. And I always had my art in my house. So, and that is so important for children to be able to do their art, not just in school, but to be, have it at home. And I was able to have that. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it was because I had asthma, but I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> Make it work. And uh, yeah, it did work. It worked for me. So as a child, um, I had a very wonderful childhood and a fabulous mother. She was a fashion designer. And you know, women didn't work in those days, so my mother was with me all the time. Mm -hmm. My father brought me my first easel. And um, I had a fantastic childhood. Wonderful. Brought up, born and raised in Harlem. And still living there. <laughs> did you grow up in the same house? Did you live in the same oh, place? All your uh, in the same area. Actually, I was born in Lower Harlem. We called it the Valley. And then when I was 12, we moved mm -hmm. up to Sugar Hill. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. That's where the... Sugar people were. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I still have my apartment uh, that we, well, no, that's, I, I still live on the same street, Edgecombe Avenue, that I lived on when we moved up there when I was 12. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a fantastic area to be in because all the artists and musicians I mean, Duke Ellington, everybody lived around us. Uh -huh. uh, Jacob Lawrence, they were, everybody was there. However, we didn't understand exactly how famous they were. We didn't get all that, because we weren't getting that in school. Mm -hmm. But those people were riding around in limousines and were just as famous as they could be. And um, we had the, ac the access to all that beautiful music and uh, it, was, it was a wonderful place to be in. And it's, it's back wonderful again. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's, and then when it came to fast forward to City College, what did you, what prompted you to go there and what did you go Well, to I was told from the time I was a little child that when I graduated from high school, I would be going to college. And uh, I think in that way, it, it was preparing me to go to college mm -hmm. because my, what, great-grandfather went to college. How's that? And B.B. Um, 
B.B. Posey, and he wanted everybody to go to college. <laughs> However, he died before he could get as many people there as he wanted. But that's what all the kids were told in our family. Mm -hmm. When you get out of high school, you're going to college. Mm -hmm. Now, at some point, I wondered which college, okay? I'm going to college, but which one? And what we saw was all these boys pouring up out of the subway on 145th Street. And we lived right across the street mm -hmm. at that time between Edgecombe and St. Nicholas. And uh, these boys would pour up out of the subway and down Convent Avenue. I didn't know where they were going. So I said, Mother, where are these boys going? And she said, oh, they're going to City College. She said, I said, well, I, I want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> that, that should be my school. She says, okay, we'll go down the street, mm -hmm. and uh, we, you can you know, see it and get used to it. So she took me down there, and I saw all these Gothic buildings, beautiful Gothic buildings. They're still there. Mm -hmm. And um, so now I knew I'm going to City College. Uh, when I became, uh, when I graduated from high school in 1948, I went down to register. And I was told I couldn't go there. And I said, what are you talking about? I can't go. I, all my life, I they said, well, this, this is a boys' school. <laughs> and then I thought about it, and I said, you know, it was all boys coming about. <laughs> <laughs> it's all boys coming up out of the cell. Where was the girl in the group? So I said, wonder why my mother didn't say to me, this is a boys' school. She did not believe in terminating anybody's desires. Mm -hmm. You're going to City College, you're going to City College. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a boy, they say it's a boys' school, but you're going anyway. So you so went to City of, College. No, one of, one of the, one of the uh, teachers there at the City College because they saw that I was not willing to accept the fact that it was a boys' school and I couldn't go there. Uh, they said, wait a minute, hold it. You, okay, you can't get a liberal arts degree, no, mm -hmm. because it is a boys' school. But what you can get is a Bachelor of Art in Education. Mm -hmm. Art education. How's that? Oh, I said, oh my goodness. My family will love that because they're all teachers. Uh -huh. They will love that because they didn't, they're a little shaky on the art thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, art thing was not fully accepted. It was because women could, what? Do, mm -hmm. but not necessarily be. Mm -hmm. You understand? So I did art, yes, but to be an artist, no, because women didn't work mm -hmm. in the 40s. Huh. It, was, it started, well, well mid-40s, 50s, when the war came mm -hmm. and the men had to go to war. Then the women started working, okay? But everybody liked the idea of the teaching. The teaching is great. That's good. <laughs> so when I got home and I said, you know, I'm going to be able to go to City College because I'm getting a Bachelor's of Art in Art Education so I can teach. Uh -huh. So they said, oh, that's wonderful. Because <laughs> they were kind of holding their breath, you know, this art thing. It's nice to do, but I mean, you don't want to be an artist because it's hard, you know what I mean. So, Faith, so you got your degree and then you started teaching first in Brooklyn and then back uptown in Harlem, mm -hmm. and talk to us about the moments that led up to the work that um, we are talking about tonight. Well, I tell you, one of the best things that could have ever happened to me was getting that degree in art education mm -hmm. so that I could teach the children, because the children are the best. They are wonderful artists, and that has just 
really inspired my work from the very beginning. Uh-huh. Yeah, the children are fantastic. And even, if I had not had, Painting, look if, at them if, if at I them. hadn't had an opportunity to teach children, I don't know, I'd probably been like a lot of people who get liberal arts degrees and never become artists. <laughs> never, never, never. <laughs> but uh, the children were, were just my stimulation and definitely uh, helped me in many, many ways. Aside from inspiring, mm -hmm. inspiration was just wonderful. Faith, when you, when you, to fast forward a little bit, so summer of 1967, and you come to paint American People series number 20, Die. Were you still teaching during those years? Had you been able to stop, sort of, what was the genesis of, of this picture? 1967, I was still teaching. I did finally quit my job in 1973 when I married my first husband, second husband. Not the first one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> no, my first husband was a musician, come on. <laughs> a jazz musician, a pianist. He was brilliant and wonderful and all like that, but he only made $15 a week. <laughs> so you don't quit anything on that, do you? <laughs> anyway, he was wonderful, but what can I say? The second one said, quit your job. Do your art. Isn't that something? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what did you ask? No, I was asking if you were still teaching in 67. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yes. I was teaching in... I started teaching in 1955, uh -huh. yeah, in 1955, I started teaching. And uh, as I said, I, I loved it. It was a wonderful experience until I finally quit in 73. In 73. But I also taught in, in college. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. So I've taught all levels from pre-kindergarten to college age. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, the, the little ones are the best. They are just so inspiring. If you've got any little kids at home, please make sure that they get a chance to do their art. Mm -hmm. Because they will be very good at it. Not necessarily forever. They may drop it at mm -hmm. about age 8, 9, 10. Mm -hmm. that, whatever that is they have may just go. But... If they don't get it early on, then it doesn't go because it never was. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's very, you know about that too, right? A bit. Yeah. I, I had kids. I still do, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, make sure they get their opportunity yeah. to do whatever is very creative in them. Their creativity is because they're not afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, they'll just go ahead and do it mm -hmm. and be it. And, mm -hmm. and it's okay. So coming back to, to die, or how did that, how did that come about? Is, was, is this the largest picture you'd made to date? Well, this was, no, oh no, definitely not. No? No. This is uh, the largest painting that I have stretched on canvas. Ah. Stretched. Ah. But I've got paintings much bigger than this hmm. that, that are not stretched. And that's when I started doing the quilts oh. so that I could make them as big as this room mm -hmm. and pick them up and roll them, and roll, roll them up mm -hmm. and, and take them wherever I needed, they needed to be. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Other than that, I had to wait till my husband comes home from work. Oh. Isn't that crazy? To carry them around. Don't right. Yes, to, you to, have to, to move be the dependent. Art. That doesn't uh -huh. make any sense. Uh -huh. So, no, that's, that's really... <laughs> One of the major reasons why mm -hmm. I started making the quilts, mm -hmm. because I could paint on canvas mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, put a backing and roll them up, put borders around, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was wonderful. So with, with this picture, did you begin it in your, did you have a studio at the time? Or I, I know I yes. read you painted it partly at least, or finished it at Spectrum Gallery? Uh, Spectrum, yes. Robert Newman, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I'll never forget him. He, I, I was in the gallery, and 
my paintings were small mm -hmm. compared to the other people because everybody was doing huge pictures. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, mine were not huge. And the summer was coming, and we were in a gallery called Spectrum Gallery on 57th Street, between 5th and 6th. And um, what they did, that was the, that was the art area. Mm -hmm. they, there was no uh, Chelsea there. And uh, so when summer came, the galleries would close and go up to, where'd they go, Doria? Yeah, up, uh, you know, to a nice place where there was a beach and all that. <laughs> And people went on vacation, huh? And the galleries would all be closed. So Robert said, look, Faith, when the gallery closes, I'm going to give you the key. Mm -hmm. And you come, and you can have the whole space to paint as mm -hmm. big as you want. Just, as, you know, because you're having your show. Show is uh -huh. coming up. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, we want you to be able to... Do the best you can. Mm -hmm. So I did this painting, Die, mm -hmm. and I did The Flag is Bleeding, and uh, the U.S. postage stamp mm -hmm. commemorating the advent of black power. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think we have an image of that. So I did all three of those. You mm -hmm. got, I think you have both. We all have of those. those. I think, right, we also have when the museum acquired the painting, you very wonderfully gave us these sketches that yes. are related to it. And well, I, will... I always do lots of sketches before I do. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, yeah, I always do lots of sketches and then uh, also studies. Dorian is the one that made me understand about the studies because I thought <coughs> I didn't know studies were art. And she said, oh, I love these studies. And I said, what? What is that? Uh -huh. And it's these Actually, they're like sketches, but they're in color. You don't, you don't have any. We don't have any in color. We just no, have Dorian these. Has <laughs> <laughs> Dorian. We'll knock on her door. Yeah. Right. right. And um, yeah, so that I get, I get to do drawings uh -huh. and studies. And, and, and then, then is, the painting. Is this the way that they're squared up, for instance, the one on the lower left? Yeah. Was that part of the way that you would scale the picture up for transfer to the canvas, or is that the motif of the s squares, right? Well, that you know, I like to square off my pictures because I was very much inspired by, what, composition of one kind and another. Actually, I thought it was because of the Bakuba. Uh -huh. But actually, I don't know whether I, I'm not sure it is that it began there, mm -hmm. uh -huh. but it certainly uh, continued Continue from there. I liked, uh, I had a lot of techniques for compositional mm -hmm. work and drawing. Mm -hmm. I, you know, those people at City College did a very good job. They taught me well. Mm -hmm. They didn't teach me anything about African-American artists or African-American art or African art. Nothing. Uh -huh. But technique. they did teach me technique. Mm -hmm. Yes, they did. Mm -hmm. And they taught me to keep good archives and a lot of very uh, important stuff. The rest of it I got myself. Yourself. I traveled. Mm -hmm. And I recommend that to all artists. Travel around the world and see the work of various different uh, people mm -hmm. and, and be inspired mm -hmm. by them. So yeah. Anne and I have brought a few different images that we want you to talk about as kind of okay. sources or reference images. Um, the first one is this photograph of a, another riot that happened on the streets of Harlem just three years before you may die. And in that summer where you were working oh. at Spectrum Gallery was a moment where, you know, long hot summer where there were riots right. oh. all over the country, Detroit, Newark. Um, but one thing I really love about your painting is that in many ways it's very different from this photograph. In this photograph, you know, mostly it's black folks who are rioting, um, whereas in your painting, it's really an interracial scene. Mm -hmm. And also, 
you know, in terms of that moment, there was a, a real fight against police brutality and other forms of inequality. But in your painting, there's a kind of um, open-endedness about what's mm -hmm. causing mm -hmm. the strife. Can you talk a little bit about the moment politically that you were in that made this painting? Well, there were several uh, reasons for me doing it. But one of them was, had to do with the fact that these riots were not pictured on television or, well, in the newspapers or, let's see, where else? In magazines. So we didn't have pictures of it. And we never saw the blood. Now, what we did see was if you were there, you got a chance to see the people running and the excitement in the street. And then you'd get home and notice that there was no talk about it on the television. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was it. I mean, uh, this uh, situation here is unique. Um, the riots in the, the, the people raiding the stores and all there protesting somebody getting killed or whatever, whatever. But that would not be recorded uh -huh. for the most part. Mm -hmm. You didn't get, it, they definitely didn't have anything like Facebook or mm -hmm. no way to record what, what's happening. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. amazing. So in a way you were making a record because it didn't exist in no, the visual world. No, you didn't have it. And uh, what I had done also was uh, the first uh, part of the American People series was not with all this movement that right. Di had. Mm -hmm. And it was because I loved <coughs> Guernica, absolutely. <coughs> See, these paintings here were not, they were the earlier mm -hmm. American people. But I wasn't interested in the movement that was going on. So Hale Woodruff decided that I didn't know how to do movement because he had a look at some, some of these like works mm -hmm. and he didn't see anything moving. So he thought that I didn't know about movement. I said, no, I know movement. I know mm -hmm. what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't put anything in I don't want. I don't, I, just because I know how to do movement doesn't mean I'm going to have it in everything I do. Mm -hmm. I have what I need, what I want, and I can do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I'll show you I know movement. Mm -hmm. And that's when I came to the conclusion that one of the big paintings, though the biggest painting I was going to do that summer, uh -huh. would be die. Would be die. Because I'm going to show Hale Woodruff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know how to make movement. <laughs> I just didn't need it, I didn't think. Uh -huh. Because it hadn't occurred to me yet that I should show the riot, although I loved Guernica. Ah, exactly. And used to take my daughters there and constantly, I mean, I went to the Museum of Modern Art. I would go, uh -huh. I would come here, uh, you know, on a weekly basis almost, mm -hmm. just to see Guernica. Yes, were there oh, lots what? of people there looking at it? Oh, or have yeah, it yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And then after it went to Spain, mm -hmm. I went there too. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the summer it went there, uh, it seems like I got sent there by the, the um, United States Information Agency. And I, I, I can't remember exactly, but I think I was in a show that they had. Uh-huh. I gotta look that up in my autobiography. Uh -huh. My two daughters just came. Here. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Used to Hello. take them. Used to bring them here all the time. <laughs> it's changed a lot, hasn't it? <laughs> since since you all used to come when you all were little. And um, yeah, to see Guernica. Mm -hmm. Guernica was my favorite. Oh, I loved it. I just loved Guernica. And so. And I would come here, and when I did, thought of the movement picture that I wanted to do, mm -hmm. Guernica immediately came to came my to mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I said, oh, how wonderful to be able to use, to think of imagery that, what, interprets something that uh, 
you're trying to express, like a riot, like mm -hmm. people who are in a place for a reason, mm -hmm. for one reason, mm -hmm. although not knowing exactly how to count. Because when you're in a riot, you don't know how you're going to riot mm -hmm. exactly. You have to be there, and mm -hmm. things happen, and then you react to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what happens? So I had to figure out what happens. Mm -hmm. What, you know, how does it begin? And you can't literally say, you know, but you can show the effects that mm -hmm. people have on each other. What are they doing? They're running away, they're grabbing each other, they're, they're holding on to each other, or they're, they're trying to get in or out of the right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Huh? One, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I was going to say one thing I um, really appreciate about seeing the American People series from 1 to 20 is that you can see so many of the different components that would make their way into die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, thinking about Let's see. these two. Oops, sorry. Go you on. kind of have this, this first moment of contact between you know, people of different races, mm -hmm. um, that is that's very... A, that's a cross in between them. Right. You see on that? On the left, yeah. Yeah. So there's, there's a willingness to do the right thing, but somehow the wrong thing gets done. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so then, you know what's right, but sometimes you can't do it. And it could go a different way. Like you see them kind of in that moment. Like, do yeah. I cross the other side? Do I right. not cross yeah, the other side? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Mm -hmm. And then in the next image, you oh, see. Oh, and oh, also that. Uh, go back to the other one. Okay. Uh, uh, you see that guy in the middle there? Mm -hmm. The head of the NAACP was white. Understand that. Yeah. There was a lot of white leadership yeah. in the organization. civil rights movement. And um, it, it had to be talked about because it was amazing to see how difficult that must have been. The NAACP mm -hmm. had a, a white leader. And uh, yeah, and I, I wanted to record all of that because mm -hmm. it did change and it has changed, but mm -hmm. that's the way it was. It was. Mm -hmm. And then this image, on the left you see, in many ways, those cocktail dresses that are so iconic in dye first come up in this image on the left. Mm -hmm. And cocktail parties, you know, there'd be one black person mm -hmm. there. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> well, somebody said he's so happy to be there. <laughs> well, look, you got to try to feed the kids and move up in life, so... <laughs> what can I say? You know, it, it was the case. And and the one on the the uh, the, um, the woman looking in the mirror mm -hmm. was an, a, an influence uh, from uh, for Picasso's something uh, Picasso girl, girl looking at a mirror. Yeah, I think so. Which is also here yeah. at MoMA. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, really? It used oh, to yeah. be oh, right yeah. at the entrance. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, it was one of the ones we used to see when we came. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, uh, the one on the left with the, art, the artist mm -hmm. painting, and he's using, it was, it, it was very difficult for black artists in those days. What kind of imagery were they going to use? What, you know, what were they going to do, this and that? Because... You know, it was not permitted and not, not accepted and so on. So you would have to break the rule and do it anyway, and I did. And I, I, I remember I sent uh, you, I think Michelle, uh, to, with that painting to be in a show. Uh, and, they, and they took it and put it in the closet. You remember that? And uh, we won't say who did that, right? <laughs> yeah, they put it in the closet. They didn't, they didn't like it. They didn't want it. And um, I had to go in. And then they couldn't find it. But they did find it. They did find it. Yeah, they found it. 
because imagery was exceedingly important. Were you going to have any white people in your painting, or were you mm -hmm. going to have black people? What were you going to do? Well, I could actually do what I wanted, because nobody's paying attention to me anyway. And that was very good in a sense, <laughs> that nobody was paying any attention to me. I didn't have anything to worry about. What, well, what about Robert Newman? Or what if, how... No, Robert Newman was different. You know, I mean, I mean, there was a larger art world out there. Uh -huh. You know, there was Robert Newman, who was very good. But I mean, uh, that was just the Spectrum Gallery. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. And so if I wanted to branch out to more places, you know, I wasn't going to get accepted. And uh, so actually, I had nothing to lose. Uh -huh. Somebody else is saying that right now. We won't mention the name. Different, different kind of person, for sure. <laughs> So Faith, these are the two other paintings that you mentioned earlier that were also yeah, in that show. I did, yeah. I, I did all three that summer. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I didn't finish all of them, but by my show was like, what, in December or something like that? Mm -hmm. uh, pardon me? In the fall? No. Uh, I think it was somewhere, sometime before the year was out. Mm -hmm. Huh? I finished all three of those paintings, mm -hmm. yes, and I took them uh, from the gallery and, and I took them to my studio. And you see, the thing of it is, I could do a big painting in my studio. Those were six by eight feet, mm -hmm. uh -huh. each one of them. The die is 12 by six feet, mm -hmm. but each one of those was six by eight. Mm -hmm. Now, I could do that in my studio but I couldn't start it there. Because in order to start a painting that big, uh -huh. you have to be able to get away from it, to see what it is you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I could do that at the gallery, but uh -huh. not in my mm -hmm. studio. My studio was too small. That's why I eventually went Moved to New them. Jersey to get me a big studio. And does that have anything to do, one question I've always wanted to ask you, Faith, is yeah. this painting right here is, made in two different parts that are put together. Is that partially because of that space negotiation? Yes, because I couldn't pick it up. I had to, <laughs> Barbara, <laughs> hey, you remember you all used to have to walk these things down the stairs? Oh. It couldn't get on the elevator. Uh -huh. with, with the six by six feet, you couldn't even get it on the elevator. You, uh -huh. I almost couldn't get it on the stairs. Right. Right. I love how this moment was, is in the painting forever. The fact that you couldn't do that together is here. Yeah. So every time we look at it, we're also kind of looking at that. Right. And you, you had to be, you had to ha be in shows. Mm -hmm. It's very important to get your work exhibited. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to exhibit your work? You can't move it. It's so big. Mm -hmm. And you gotta wait for your husband to come home from work. That's <laughs> crazy. It doesn't make any sense, you know? So the painting is exhibited, mm -hmm. and we have a photo here of a couple of the folks who were there for the opening. Oh my God, yes. <laughs> this was my first really important show mm -hmm. at the Spectrum, mm -hmm. Robert Newman. Mm -hmm. After that, summer. And here's Romy Bearden and uh, uh, Mayhew, Richard, Richard Mayhew. Mayhew. Mm -hmm. And this other guy, I can't remember his name, but he was very important in the art world. Huh. Yeah, and so everybody came out. Oh my God, there were 400 people at the opening. That was a lot. Because uh -huh. uh -huh. this, this gallery, didn't, the space wasn't that big. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he, what he did too, was he took one of the rooms in the gallery and he gave it to Barbara and Michelle to bring their little crowd from New Lincoln School. And they had um, some music. Huh? What was that music they were playing for you? <laughs> yeah, but on what kind of machine? What? A record player? A record player. Mm -hmm. They had a record player for the children to dance. Motown. Motown, OK for the children to dance. So the children were in there dancing. Uh-huh. Children being 14 and 15. 14 and 15, okay, good. And that was, oh, I, I thought that was wonderful that he made something for you all to do at the show. 
<laughs> Bertie came and uh, brought uh, cases of, of wine and then went to work. Uh-huh. Because that's what it had to be, mm -hmm. you know. Uh-huh. Yeah. Did Hale Woodruff show up? Uh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Just asking. No. <laughs> I, no. <laughs> But it was a success immediately. Oh, the, the yeah. Reception a was lot of people came. In the, the press, huh? in yeah, the oh, artist absolutely. community. Immediately there was show, positive reviews. And it was reviews. big. Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was big. What was the first thing you saw when you came in the gallery? Was it die or was it the... The first thing you saw when you got off that elevator was die. And there was mm -hmm. one woman mm -hmm. who came and she said, and jumped back on the elevator and went downstairs. <laughs> because she saw the blood. Uh -huh. And uh, years later, in the 80s, I was at some museum, and there was a teacher there with her students. And she asked me, would I say something to the students about die? And I said, sure. And I said, one of the most difficult things that I ever painted in my life was this picture because of the blood. First of all, blood is different colors. And it, it gives you the creeps to paint blood because you know where you, where you're, where you have blood, there's death. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was trying to get that over. And if they did show a photograph or a picture of any kind of riot, they never showed the blood. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never showed the blood. So I wanted to make sure that I put the blood in there because I knew that blood meant death. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened mm -hmm. at those riots. Mm -hmm. So I said to the group of children, that it was so difficult painting that blood because it just gave me the creeps. And one little boy, he must have been about eight or so, he said, what blood? Now this was 1980 80, something. Yeah. So by then, this was nothing. This was blood, that blood, nothing. Isn't mm. that interesting? Now in the 60s, there was no blood, no nothing, although there was blood. Mm -hmm. There wasn't pictured blood. Mm -hmm. By the 80s, mm -hmm. The kids had seen so much blood, this was not blood. Was so now what do we have for now, 2016? Yeah. It's, you know what I mean? It mm -hmm. just goes mm -hmm. on and on, the violence. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's difficult, but yeah. what can I say? Could you talk a little bit about the choice of the people who are in this picture and the black and white and, and what they're wearing, how you made those choices. Well, I wanted people to understand that it's, it's not just poor people breaking in stores and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What is happening is people are trying to maintain their position in life, either rightly or wrongly trying to keep one group down. One group is trying to keep the other from advancing. Another group is trying to maintain their position. Another group is trying to get out of the way. So you've got all of these things that are happening. Mm -hmm. Everybody is involved. Nobody mm -hmm. gets away without the struggle. Mm -hmm. There is a struggle. Mm -hmm. uh, Freedom is not free. Everybody is going to have to pay a price to be free. And caught in the proper position, they'll just have to do something about it immediately. Mm -hmm. huh? And you don't know when that is. So I'm just hoping that we don't get some of the action that we got during the 60s, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. now, Doesn't. in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think we brought along this picture 
to for you because <laughs> we want to talk a little bit about your perspective as a daughter, as a, as a mother, um, and how that informed the subject matter of dye or, or your approach to art making. Well, there's me and my two daughters who are here in the front, and my mother, who, who was a fashion designer. And um, we are going, it's 1961, and we're on the SS Liberté, taking our first trip to Europe. And what I went there for was I wanted to see some of, a lot of black artists would leave America and go to Europe mm -hmm. to be artists because they couldn't get to have a, a, an exhibit. They, they couldn't get anywhere here. And so they went abroad. And I wanted to talk to them and see, because I was trying to figure out, 61, mm -hmm. do you really want to be an artist? I mean, are you really going to do this struggle? I mean, you're looking at all these people, and Jake and all of them, and Romy, and they're, having, they're catching hell. So you want, you want that really, or what do you want? Why don't you go over there? And you can, you know, take your daughters and your mother. And, um, and then you can look them up, because many of them were over there, mm -hmm. and see how are they doing. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and then you'll decide whether or not you want to continue. Mm -hmm. Do you want to give it all that you have to give it? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know whether it's going to happen or what's going to happen. And, you know, you want to be successful, but you don't want to be unreasonable. You want to have a chance to be. You know what I mean? Okay, so why don't you go and talk to them and see what the deal is. Mm -hmm. So there we are on the SS Liberté. Barbara and Michelle met some kids over there that were looking for Bob Hope. <laughs> He yeah. was on the boat. They were looking for Bob Hope. They were <laughs> running all over that boat. Hi. Looking for Bob Hope. It sounds and, like and, a and movie. He, he stayed one step ahead of you. He, you never, you never found him, Bob you? Hope? You never got him. Hmm? Amazing. They wouldn't allow that today, would they? Uh, I don't know. Oh, I don't think so. I've been on an ocean <laughs> liner recently. Oh, it was fantastic. Uh, the, the parents of these other children were in the bar. And uh, my mother and I would not be in the bar because uh, that, was, that was when I first learned how to have my wine with my meals. <laughs> because before that, if you drank wine, you were a wino. <laughs> but not when you're on no. SS Liberté. Well, I'd never been on the SS yeah. Liberté. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I learned how because we had wine at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. <laughs> Oh, my God, the food was fantastic, and there was wine at all three meals. And, I mean, you could have wine all day, and you could just have, oh, it was wonderful. That's why the kids were running crazy, because the parents were gone. <laughs> you were pop I don't know what's happening today, but I, back then, it yeah. was too Not much. Not as good as that. <laughs> as, that was the last voyage of the SS Liberté, by the way. Ah, uh, in 61. Hmm? 61, yes. It got parked in the harbor there and just stayed there stayed forever. There. So I think we're, we're, close. We're, we're close. We were going to show a few pictures to talk with Faith about what happened after Die. Can I ask you a question yeah. as you were talking about your, your activism um, in the next image? Um, here, th we're in a place that might look familiar. Museum of Modern Art. Yes. Um, and this, as far as I understand, is a demonstration that Tom Lloyd, the artist, invited you to participate in as part of the Art Workers Coalition. Yes. Um, in which there was a demand to have a, a wing here at the museum. Oh, yes. MLK Junior Wing for African American and Puerto Rican art. Can you talk about oh, yes. your activism in relationship? And the director of the museum who was, I can't remember his name, came mm -hmm. to my house. 69. Bates Lowry. Bates Lowry. Right, Thank you, Michelle. Bates Mrs. Lowry. Michelle Allagott, the really? chief of the archives. 
So. Thanks, <laughs> Lowry, right? Yes, he came to my house to tell me that he had been in touch with Martin Luther King's wife. And she, he was dead, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it says it. And she did not want the wing at, at the money. She wanted it in, she wanted the money to go to uh, Atlanta, huh? To do something with Martin Luther King's whatever. She didn't get the art part, but he did. He did. Bates Lowry. Yes. <laughs> and that would have been so fantastic. I can't, they, they just didn't appreciate or understand what that was. So we never got the wing for Martin Luther King at the Museum of Modern Art. But you did, there were two shows that the activism did lead to, right? There was a Romare Bearden show and a Richard Hunt Yeah, show. you got Romare Bearden and, uh, and, and uh, what's his name? Richard, Richard Hunt. Hunt. Richard Hunt, mm -hmm. right. Michelle writes beautifully about it in the blog post that she published. Oh, really? Oh, I'd like ago. to see that. Anybody would like to read it. <laughs> okay, very good. And let's see, oh, we brought um, a picture that in, I think, oh. John Hendricks and is you. He John is here. He's up oh, there. Oh, hi, John. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> well, you know, they're talking about uh, the flag burnings again. You know that, right? <laughs> is that interesting, huh? Are you ready? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Don't. Don't give up. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you want to explain maybe a little bit about the People's Flag Show at the Judson Memorial Church The People's Flag Show, 1970? which was a fantastic exhibition at the Judson Church in which John and Jean Tosh and, uh, put together with me. And uh, everybody participated in it. It was a fantastic show. Mm -hmm. um, there, were, there was dancing with uh, Yvonne Rayner. Yvonne Rayner. And um, I mean, the art world turned out for, to defend the flag. So somebody better tell somebody, because uh, we don't allow that. Freedom of speech is absolutely imperative. Mm -hmm. You can't have art of any kind without freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. So I think we have just a few more images. I wonder if we should open questions up to the audience, or we brought this picture of you. Where, where is, I mean, what, what are we, how many, are we running out of time? We're a little, we're, we're moving on. Maybe five more, five more minutes, right. and then we'll open it up for questions from everyone. Keep going. Keep going? Okay. okay, all right. Well, this um, United States of Attica. Right? Of Attica, right. right? That was yeah, because we had the prison uh, situation. Right, was so awful, and so I did this map uh -huh. of America to talk about all the different ways in which America has been violent, all the violence in all the states. It is a uh, a, 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 a wonderful research of U United States violence mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, and was all there and one reason I feel like for me at least this work is important is that it really shows the entrance of text and language yeah. into your work in a direct way obviously narrative is always a part of what you were doing but to think forward to your autobiography mm -hmm. to think about you know quilting as a process of storytelling this is where you see text, letters, language mm -hmm. directly in your work. Yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's uh, definitely a part of what I do. And um, I'm and, so I happy know. I did it too, by the way, because it helps me to, to understand what it is. There, there's Tar Beach. The, um, the book Tar Beach was, was um, published in 1990 one, and the quilt in 1988. Uh -huh. So it was 
um, the quilt that got my first children's book. Mm -hmm. And I had started writing on my quilts mm -hmm. because I had written my autobiography and couldn't get it published. Because the publisher said, look, uh, that's not your story. And I was wondering how could somebody else tell me what my story, story was. Yeah. <laughs> that's a lack of freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't decide, look at me, and then decide what my story is. I tell you what my story is. That's my job. So I said, now, what I have to do is I have to find a way to get around that situation mm -hmm. so that I don't have to be published in order to tell my story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started writing huh. on the quilts. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrea Cascardi is her name. I love her to death. She was an editor at Random House. Mm -hmm. And my dealer at the time was Bernice Steinbaum. And Bernice had made posters of that quilt. Uh -huh. And the doctors were having them in their offices and everything. So Andrea was at her doctor's office, and she had one of these posters, a uh -huh. big poster that uh, Bernice had made. And um, she read the story. And she said, this would make a great children's uh -huh. book. And so she called me up and she said, would you be interested? And I said, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I, nobody ever, you know, I don't know anything about it. Because at City College, they never taught us anything about illustration, by uh -huh. the way. There was a great deal of prejudice about illustrations because it wasn't supposed to be art. Oh. Okay? So I said, I, I don't know anything about illustration. And I... I just don't know anything except that I, I, I know one thing. You don't turn down an opportunity. That's not smart. <laughs> no, somebody gives you an opportunity to do something, and you take it. Yeah. So I said, well, I'll, I'll do it, yeah. She said, would you like to make a children's book out of, out of, uh, out of this quilt? And mm -hmm. I said, sure. She said, you don't need to change one word. And I didn't. Not how? one word was changed. Oh, how great. I didn't yeah. realize that. She said, that. I'm going to send you a dummy book. Mm -hmm. A dummy book is 32 pages. Mm -hmm. She made up the 32-page dummy book and took the words that's on the quilt and laid it on the pages uh -huh. and sent it to me. And in a month's time, I did the illustrations to go with it. And we got to our beach. Hmm. Right. And then yeah. the here we are. 16 books later. Right. Here's yeah. a small sampling. Right? No, 17. 17. So 16, include, 16 more. So yeah. 17 total. 17 more. I've done 18 children's oh, eight, okay. books. And including We Came to America, which came out just this year. We Came to America is, is, is 2016. And none of them have been an issue. I haven't had to you know, struggle with anybody about anything. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't have a whole lifetime of struggle, can you? <laughs> well, I hope not. But <laughs> <laughs> I oh, hope my, not. my. Yeah, We Came to America was, uh, oh, sorry. Go was um, very, very difficult. In, in fact, I think it might have been the most difficult one because so many different people came here and mm -hmm. so many different mixtures of people. And I don't want to leave any way out mm -hmm. because... I want the children, and, and now today we've got so many different ethnicities of mm -hmm. children, and I wanted them all to be able to see themselves. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I had to search the map and, you know, just go through everything, and, 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 I, and I think it's pretty good, and, and I think the children like it, and it's out there, and I'm very happy yeah. about it. I think it should be mandatory reading for adults really? and children. Okay. Absolutely. Kidding. It's uh, a vision of America that is inspiring. Yeah, and that we can it is. It, I think mm -hmm. it's inspiring. So, it inspired me, for sure. So to sort of wrap up our, our part of this, mm -hmm. Thomas and I wanted to ask you if contemporary events, our current historical moment, have changed the way that you see American people, number 20, die? Um, well, I'm just glad I did it. 
Mm-hmm. And um, and I and I, I I see it coming. People disrupting uh, the peace and tranquility of our country. Not that we're all that tranquil, but um, I think that people will definitely not sit still and allow uh, our freedoms to be assaulted. So, so I think now, We'd like to ask if anyone in the audience or our online audience has a question for Faith. And if you raise your hand, our... Someone will bring you a mic, I think. So 1967 was also the year of the Supreme Court case ruling of Richard and Mildred Loving. And I wanted to know if that had any effect on the interracial component of the painting die. The uh, interracial component? Of, of having white and black. Because when I saw the two little kids cowering, for some reason that couple came into my mind and I realized that it was the same year as well. Yeah. I think children don't uh, necessarily come into the world uh, with prejudice toward each other. They have to be taught that. And uh, I think... I know they have to be taught that. So that had nothing to do with it. I mean, as a matter of fact, the reason why I wanted those three, two children there is because to prove that they don't. Children mm-hmm. uh, have to be taught that some other people who don't look like them are not right. That's the only way they're going to really get it. Now, does that answer your question? A little bit. I just was wondering if that time in history, if that case had any effect on the painting or anything. Uh, Could you run that case to me quickly? Yes. So Mildred and Richard Loving was the case of a black woman and a white man um, trying to be legally married in the state that they were living in, which wasn't allowed. Virginia. Virginia. Yeah, the Loving, you know, it, it's bringing to me another case, but I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, it had anything to do with that, no. The children are innocent. The only real innocent parties in this whole thing are the children. I was wondering if you could um, talk about the painting of the individual faces the and what? how that evolved over the summer or the period when this was painted. The individual faces of the people? Yes, please. Well, I wanted them to show how desperately, what, painful and frightening it must be. Although I have never been, uh, I have never been an, a what, a participant in a, Race a blood riot. Of any kind. I always got. I could feel something happening. I'm gone. (laughs) I mean, I've been places where something happened, Mm -hmm. but I left before Mm -hmm. it got going. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I can imagine that it must be horrible. And I was trying to capture that in the faces with the eyes and the, mm-hmm. and the frightened look of the people um, to get. I remember being in a, in a, in a theater mm-hmm. and having something break mm-hmm. out. And mm-hmm. I, I was near the door. Mm-hmm. So. <laughs> <laughs> but some people were nosy. You know, they wanted to see what was happening. But I knew what was happening. Somebody is trying to start a, a riot of some kind. And I don't need to know the details. <laughs> I can leave. And I was near the door, and I did. That sounds very wise. <laughs> I can't stop option. it. I mean, if, if there was a way that I could stop it, I would have done that. Mm-hmm. But I, I could see that I was just one person who mm-hmm. would probably end up uh, 
you know how. Mm -hmm. Could you speak about your time in Paris and what you found? You mentioned, I'm here. <laughs> you mentioned that you were going to see the experience of artists there. And Who's talking? I am. <laughs> okay. Yes. Go ahead. And so you, you went on the trip with your, with your family and you were seeking to see the experience of black artists in Paris in the 60s. What did you find when you were there? How did it influence you upon having that experience? Well, I could see that it, it was not beneficial. Uh, I think they were not able to escape the struggle uh, for many reasons. One of them also was the fact that the United States owed them a certain amount of recognition if they paid the price. Now, the price was going to be high. But if they left, like for instance, um, what's her name, Elizabeth Catlin. Mm -hmm. That was a mistake for her to leave America. Mm -hmm. Because she never got her due. She went to Mexico and many people wanted to claim that she was Mexican. She was not. She married a Mexican, mm -hmm. I believe. Mm -hmm. Huh? She what? She was an African-American, but I said she married a Mexican. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, they felt like they didn't have to do anything for her mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. she's not an American. She's a Mexican. So she was pretty well known in Mexico, but not here. Mm -hmm. And um, I think in Europe was the same, very much the same situation. It was not beneficial, let's put it that way. It might have been more comfortable for many of the African-American artists to, mm -hmm. to be in Europe, but it was not beneficial. It wasn't beneficial to them, and it wasn't beneficial to us, mm -hmm. because we didn't get a chance to experience them mm -hmm. in the way that we would have. If they had stayed here and just took the knocks and mm -hmm. bruises that the rest of us Mm -hmm. so it was as though they took themselves so out of the conversation. They took themselves out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I did detect that. I saw that. It was very hard finding mostly all of them. I couldn't find them. Huh? Yeah, we couldn't find them. And when we did, it was not, not good. Mm -hmm. um, um, hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I'm wondering if you could just talk about the choice to title the painting Die. I feel like we've talked about how the subject matter is a riot, and you, that could have been the choice of, of title, but the title is so stark um, and with that choice of words, so I'm just curious about the, that decision. What is stark? The title. The title. Die. Oh, die. Versus calling it, you know, a race riot or, you know, a riot or an uprising or whatever. Well, let me tell you something. Titles for artworks are the most difficult part of making them, to me. What to title them? It's just awful, you know? And uh, so I spend my, most of my time with the conception, the idea. What is it about? What's happening? Who's doing what to who and da di da mm -hmm. And then after all of that's done, now I've got to come up with this title. And that is so hard. So I said, oh my God, what am I going to call it? Die. Because that's what's going to happen here. People are going to die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I came up with it. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions from the internet? No. Okay. No. This one in the center here. If the microphone people are. Don't everybody speak at once, please. <laughs> Hi. Hi, um, my name is Jonathan. I was uh, just referencing the comment you made earlier about how children in the 80s were increasingly more desensitized to blood. And I'm thinking about now as a millennial, um, so many of the atrocities against human rights are televised. We see them on YouTube. And I was just uh, thinking, you know, if, 
if that was the reaction in 1967 to a lady coming into your exhibition and being frightened and we are increasingly more desensitized, what do you think, um, you know, as artists, as creators, that needs to be done in order to keep that conversation open? You know, how do we uh, make artwork that's not anesthesia and kind of makes young people aware of the blood so that it's not so passive and that we're not so, you know, passive about human life and human condition? Well, that, that, that's a, a, a good question. And I think that we just have to pay attention to our lives and who we are and tell the story in some way. I mean, nobody's trying to tell anyone how to do it, but just don't necessarily ignore it. There are so many ways as an artist you can tell the story, make the point. And I think that it should be done by those who, who can and will and want to. Hi, I had a question. Mama Ringo all over here. <laughs> I wanted to know, for you, what was more of a revolutionary or radical act, painting and putting blood in dye, or 20 years later, painting a black girl being free, floating in the sky, being, um, being who she is and all that she is? Which is the most what? What was the most, um, for you, uh, radical act, radical painting? Well, you know, actually, when I'm doing it, I don't see any of it as radical. I, I see it as the moment, what I'm seeing, what I'm needing to do at the moment. And uh, I'm just so pleased that I have the opportunity to, it, to do it, that the idea came to me, because you have to think about these things. You know, you have to give yourself permission to do these things. Uh, and I'm glad that I did that and that I came up with the ideas because you're constantly thinking about what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you have to have a body of work. I mean, that was the thing that my, my mm -hmm. professors made it very clear to me. You need a body of work. <laughs> you mustn't stop working. You've got to keep working. Mm -hmm. Working, working, working. And whether you're selling anything or not, that, you know, but you got to keep working. So how are you going to keep working and you're not selling anything? You really got to talk to yourself. Yeah, you got to explain hard. it to yourself. Make yourself understand it. And uh, just keep on doing it. So one way or the other. And what I do is I try to think of ways to explain my life and what's going on around me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what I'm doing right now mm -hmm. uh, because we have this situation that uh, is happening in America and um, <laughs> Dye is at the, at the, at the uh, modern and, um, and I'm, I'm doing my game. Huh? <laughs> Quilt to Duco, have you heard of it? You yeah. have. Well, do you play it? <laughs> All right, now. And so I think it's a way of making art. It's a way of using images and imagery. And we as artists uh, can do it on and on and on. Whereas I think we're more privileged than some of the other fields of art, uh, like uh, music threatens mm -hmm. your body. So as you get older, you've got to stop hmm. beating your drum and blowing your horn and whatever, whatever. Uh, as an artist, as long as you keep your eyesight intact, you, you, can, you can create art. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful that way. And, and what you see and what you make as an artist will change not only the outside of it, but the inside of you with it. So you can do it. And you should do it. And Quilt Duco 
is part of it. <laughs> and it's available on the iTunes store. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's I, available on iTunes. <laughs> and and uh, and what is the other one? The play, uh, Google Play. Google, Google play. play. So I think I think we'll ask if there is one more question, and if there's not, we'll invite everybody to join us out front for a glass yes, of wine. Yes, and I I, I I think I I didn't mention that uh, my dealer is here. <laughs> <laughs> Dorian. <laughs> Dorian. Dorian, All right. yes. I, and I mentioned uh, uh, Bernie Steinbaum, who was actually my first dealer. Not Robert. Robert Newman was the director of the gallery, but the gallery was a co-op. Mm -hmm. It was an amazing co-op. Mm -hmm. And that's Robert Newman. And then there was Bernie Steinbaum. But here we have Dorian Bergen, ACA Gallery. <laughs> And I, wait, just let me tell you this story. I've always <laughs> wanted, because the two people connected with ACA are here. Linda Freeman, my good friend, who made, made that wonderful uh, video of me, huh? came to, what, Lanapu? Yeah, and did that wonderful video. And then she went to uh, ACA to do somebody else. Who was that person? Uh-oh. Jacob Lawrence and some other people. And so um, she took the first uh, video that she did in her series of videos, which are the best there is of an artist, and she played it to show Dorian what she could do. And um, Cy, Sydney, Sydney, mentioned that he, had, he was aware of my work and that he liked it. And Linda knew that ACA was my favorite gallery. I mean, that was where I went because I wanted to see the African-American artists and they were the only ones that were showing them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I loved ACA, and, but I didn't want to go and ask them, could I be in their gallery? <laughs> because I didn't want them to say no. Mm. You understand what I mean? Somebody says no, that means go and don't look back. And I, I wasn't going to do that, so I figured let me just shut up and don't ask anything. And uh, Sid said, I like her. <laughs> yeah, she's good. And Linda said, oh my God, she wants to be here. She, and he said, well, she should come. And he ended up at my house and uh, and then I've been with ACA ever since. <laughs> so. I have so many stories like this. <laughs> yeah. So I think thank everyone for coming. And yes. we'll see you out front. For more stories. For more stories. Right. More with stories. Faith. Thank you. <laughs>